from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Tomoko Steen at Science, Technology and Business Division here at the Library of Congress. Today's event is organized by uh, our division, Science and Technology and Business. Sometimes we co-sponsor these events with uh, other part of the library. Today's speaker uh, is Dr. Ilya Zaslavsky, is a director of the Sp Sp Spatial Information System Lab at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is a part of the University of California, San Diego. Uh, his research focus on a um, very <laughs> complex uh, program, it's a distri distributed information management systems and uh, spatial and uh, temporal data integration. So Dr. Daslavsky received his PhD from University of Washington in geology in 1995, and before he came to this country, uh, he was he also received his PhD from Russian Academy of Science in 1990. He has led design and uh, technical development for several large cyber infrastructure projects supported by National Science Foundation, and uh, that's include AskCube and the National Scale Hydrologic Information System. Um, he's also co-chair of the OGC WMO Hydrology Domain, work, um, Domain Working Group, which is a uh, way to develop international standard for the uh, water data. I hope I said it right. <laughs> and today, Dr. Zaslovsky <laughs> is going to talk about a very exciting uh, topic, SDG, which is Sustainable Development Goals. SDG is a United Nations initiative and uh, its uh, long name is Transformation, Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is a set of 17 uh, go, um, global goals with 169 targets. So the aims are the end poverty, to protect the planet, and um, ensure pro uh, prosperity for all of us on the earth. So the goal was uh, put forward 2015 by UN. And um, before I go to all diff difficult, <laughs> you know, the words, I think it's the best to, you know, explain by the speaker. So before further ado, please join us welcoming Dr. Ilya Zaslavsky. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Steen, for a very nice introduction. Uh, I am Ilya Zaslavsky. I'm going to uh, talk about sustainable development goals, but uh, sustainable development goals is just one of the applications of the software uh, that uh, we developed. And uh, I will start. A with uh, uh, describing general trends in computing and in cyber infrastructure and try to talk through uh, transformations that are happening in the computing world and see how the tools that we have been developing recently help uh, bring in more people, engage users, and make it easier to uh, access data and analyze data. So one of the applications is sustainable development goal indicators, uh, but there are several other applications, and time permitting, I will show you a few that would range from um, uh, Picasso and Van Gogh paintings to some biodiversity image collections to, to other uh, library collections. Uh, this talk may be a little unusual because uh, I don't have that many slides. I will uh, do the introduction and then we'll try to switch 
uh, to a live demo. I think I'll, I'll tell you where I come from. Uh, I work at San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is uh, which is um, a fairly large and one of the oldest supercomputing centers in the country. It was one of five original centers funded in 1985. Uh, we work on uh, high performance computing and uh, advanced networking. Uh, uh, but more recently, the focus has uh, been uh, cyber infrastructure. Uh, I hope you've heard this word. So these are uh, the key part here is infrastructure. We're trying to make it such that you don't need to understand the details of computing in order to be able to use it. Similar to uh, uh, electrical grid. Electrical grid is a very common metaphor used to explain infrastructure. You uh, plug your appliance to an outlet and you should be able to use it without understanding the details of how uh, electricity is generated. Uh, in computing, uh, there are of course lots of databases and uh, uh, cloud services and web services and uh, devices and many different components are involved in order to deliver the data and some services to, to users and users are not supposed to understand how you know the mechanics of it they should be able to uh, to uh, just plug in to, to find the data or plug in their own data and be able to use it that's uh, currently um, a dream uh, and a very big challenge uh, and uh, research on in this area is being funded by National Science Foundation and NASA and DOE and other agencies. Uh, right, so um, cyber infrastructure and uh, this slide is from uh, uh, Jim Carossi who is the head of uh, uh, computing and uh, uh, um, uh, engineering department uh, uh, division at NSF. Uh, uh, just to give you an outline of what cyber infrastructure is and what is the vision of cyber infrastructure at NSF. Uh, you have a lot of different types of resources that include uh, cloud resources and uh, uh, various compute systems, storage systems, and, and, and so on. And some of these are supported by NSF, and there are, of course, lots of resources in um, the commercial world, there are international resources and so on. Uh, on top of it, there is middle middleware layer where that manages communications and exchange between uh, between different systems and uh, uh, um, helps to orchestrate uh, the systems working together. Uh, there are some uh, acronyms here which I'm not going to uh, uh, spell out, uh, but uh, if you have large data sets sitting con in different storage systems, you may want to connect them, and so there is a brokering system. If you want to access these different systems, you may need to have a single sign-on system so that you don't log into each individual uh, uh, system to work with it. And on top of it, there are science-focused applications, uh, and there, is l there are a lot of tools being, uh, that have been developed in, in this domain, including various APIs and portals and gateways that support different, uh, different sciences. Uh, so the, the dream is uh, how to move it to become uh, more plug and play so that we don't have to think about each individual uh, operation and these operations are uh, hidden from us, kind of towards the, the uh, uh, electric grid. Um, uh, this is, uh, as I said, challenging because we see a lot of transformation going on in, in different uh, areas of computing. So that's another slide from NSF, and uh, uh, which outlines uh, uh, so-called cyber infrastructure ecosystem. Uh, and that includes organizations and compute resources and software networking. Uh, changes are happening in all of them. Uh, software uh, used to be developed by small groups. Uh, now this is large-scale collaborative activity that uh, uh, involves multiple groups working together, so they have to communicate. Uh, they have to uh, uh, be able not to uh, um, step with each other's toys so, uh, to, 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 to make this work smooth. Organizations have to align what they, uh, uh, what they do to support uh, collaborative science. Um, Scientific instruments have to plug into the same infrastructure and be able to uh, not only provide data but also provide 
information about how this data has been connect, uh, collected so that you can always go back and understand uh, the origins and try to, to, to explain where it comes from. And of course, uh, uh, huge uh, changes in the data. Uh, what we have um, been generating in, the, in, in, in a year or in two years uh, exceeds what has been uh, generated in all previous times. And so the questions are, uh, do we want to store this data? That's not possible because we, we, we generate more data than we can store. Do we want to somehow mine this data? How you decide what is important to keep, what, what, what can be discarded? Uh, and how, most importantly, how to use it um, such that it uh, brings along benefits for, for uh, uh, for, for, for everybody. So uh, this is a very complex system and transformations are going on in all uh, parts of it and so no, there's no surprise that people are talking about uh, revolution in and sometimes call it big data revolution and these are just some of the snapshots that I uh, pulled off the web. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, 40 zettabytes of uh, uh, data in digital universe and zettabyte is 10 to the power of 21, sextillion or something like, something like that. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a huge amount of content posted on uh, YouTube and Facebook, um, uh, 200 million emails sent each minute. Uh, so this is a huge amount of information to handle. And if you want to make use of it, of this information, there should be tools that can quickly uh, parse this data. So the entire ecosystem, software ecosystem, is changing to tune to, to these amounts uh, of data. Uh, how people have defined big data. In 2001, there was an original paper that started with three Vs. Uh, uh, big data is data that has huge volume, comes at you with at high velocity, and presents a, a large variety of data types. Uh, that uh, idea of adding more Vs uh, uh, <laughs> became quite popular, and uh, uh, that, that's a clear sign of a marketing hype, of course, so eventually you end up with um, vendors claiming that only our software can solve your uh, uh, verisimilitude problems. Um, and other types of Vs that have been added. Um, but volume, velocity, and variety are perhaps the most important characteristics that uh, everybody who works with data have been trying to, uh, to tune to. Um, <laughs> so this is just to emphasize the point that you really want to have uh, a grid-like system where you don't want to understand uh, uh, the, the crazy variety of uh, tools and systems that exist, they, they have overlapping boundaries, they don't necessarily talk the same language, uh, they don't necessarily connect with each other. Uh, and if uh, it also highlights uh, the importance of um, uh, nurturing new type of scientists who actually can navigate in, in uh, uh, this huge ecosystem and figure out what is usable and what is connectable. Uh, that's a big data landscape that uh, is compiled from multiple versions, have, it happens to every year, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of systems here that, lots of systems that are not mentioned on this chart. Uh, what we have been doing in, in, in this space, and so, so this is my lab, we uh, have been working mostly on spatial data integration and large information systems, uh, and uh, I'll just mention a couple of them. One is hydrologic information system. I uh, note here that it's the largest in the world, uh, probably the largest in the world. Uh, it's hard to make <laughs> claims like that uh, because it's not a single database. It's a system where you can connect to multiple uh, databases that follow the same, uh, the same language and the same protocol. So the first thing we, we did when we tried to organize such, such a system is to develop this common language. It's was called water markup language. Uh, if uh, you can uh, ex expose your data in this language, then it would be unambiguously interpreted by, uh, by, by any client. And that's an important component of different systems, 
uh, talking to each other. Uh, so uh, this language has been adopted by multiple groups, uh, uh, universities, and federal agencies. And as a result, we have a system where you can, from, from a single client, you can query all of them. Uh, another interesting example is with um, uh, with integration of brain data. Uh, when you work with neuroscience uh, atlases, with, in, in this case we have worked with uh, atlases of rodent brain, uh, people uh, develop uh, photographic slices and organize them as stacks. And uh, it is important to understand uh, a, a distribution of a signal that you see in one collection of slices, how it relates to something that has been observed by other people in, in other country in, in a different research group. Uh, the key question here is um, how you can relate information about location in the brain. So it's not, it's not uh, Earth, so there is no latitude longitude here, not to mention that all brains are different. So it, you have to come up with some kind of probabilistic uh, uh, um, uh, specification of location and then develop a set of services that would exchange information about location so that once you register your slices to, to the system, you would be able to get a gene expression, segmentations, and other data that are, uh, 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 that somebody had observed in that part of the brain. Uh, so you can, you, you see from, from these two examples, we've been working mostly in the middleware realm. Uh, uh, but I was actually planning to talk about a different project where I think we are uh, trying to tap into a totally different part of uh, uh, big data challenges. Uh, and that is making data accessible and easy to use by large groups of people. Uh, so I will be talking about the system called SWAF. Uh, SWAF uh, uh, no references to shampoo. It uh, uh, stands for survey analysis via visual exploration. Uh, and surveys are um, uh, treated somewhat generically here. So it's not just questionnaire surveys. It could be uh, biodiversity surveys or um, vegetation surveys, soil surveys, um, and other types of collections where you have uh, uh, information that may come from observations from some annotations from notes, from uh, devices, from, from anything. And so, so you have very heterogeneous information that you need to explore and kind of figure out where you start subsequent analysis. So uh, uh, you see that uh, there are different types of applications. Uh, even on this screen, uh, I have a uh, public opinion survey and uh, Van Gogh paintings, which each of these paintings has some metadata that you can uh, use to slice and dice your, uh, your collection. Uh, you can have different views of the data, uh, map views, uh, bar charts, uh, cross tabs, and so on. Uh, before uh, I was hoping to show you the demo, uh, uh, I will uh, talk about another type of data revolution. So data revolution is a term used by United Nations to uh, uh, highlight the challenges that people now have with managing uh, development worldwide. It's very important to have information about what's going on in different countries and how countries perform on various measures uh, so that to be able to make decisions and to be able to assess where each country is with respect to uh, sustainable development goals. So in, in 2014, there was a UN report that proposed a uh, global partnership for... We the yes, thank you. A uh, uh, partnership for sustainable development data, and the key component of it was agreeing on sustainable uh, development goals and developing indicators to monitor progress of uh, uh, every country uh, that subscribed to... to uh, uh, to this document, and there are 194 countries that, that agreed to, to follow that system. Uh, so uh, in September of uh, 2015, uh, uh, this program, Transforming Our World, that 
2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted that specified 17 uh, sustainable development goals. This is the program for United Nations for the next 15 years. Uh, in the previous 15 years, uh, the program was called Millennium Development Goals and it was adopted after uh, Millennium um, Summit in 2010, also focused on 15-year uh, period. Uh, there were eight goals. Uh, the, the progress has been actually quite remarkable on these eight goals, but very uneven across countries. Uh, and uh, the 17 goals are just started, so we have baseline data for uh, each country um, on these goals. Goals include uh, eradicating poverty and uh, uh, hunger, uh, establishing conditions for good health and well-being, education, uh, and a bunch of other measures that deal, uh, or targets that deal with um, um, development, uh, especially sustainable development, ecological factors, and social, uh, social inclusion. Let's try, right? Uh, so this is the website, uh, suave.sdsc.edu, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, there's a gallery, there are news, there are blogs, and a few other common uh, uh, elements of a website. If you go to news and search for SDGs, uh, there will be an application that deals with SDG indicators. Uh, you see that what I have here is a collection of flags for each country. You can uh, look at uh, uh, different types of uh, representations, uh, uh, maps, and so on. Uh, uh, I can map by, let's say, sustainable development goal rank. So all countries are ranked in terms of how uh, close they are to fulfilling the, the, the goals. If I look at, uh, let's say, sustainable development goal rank, um, and look at, let's say, the first 40, you would see that the best countries in terms of closeness to uh, getting to SDGI indicators are Scandinavian countries. What is the source of the data that these countries Yes. Very good question. So it, it is a fairly complicated process. Uh, there is UN Statistical Commission that compiles data from multiple sources. And of course, it has to rely on uh, local sources, uh, but it, uh, there are multiple verifications that happen. Uh, the, the most difficult thing is to align different uh, types of di different measurement protocols. But one of the key uh, uh, goals here was to define such indicators that would be measured more or less unambiguously across across countries. SDGI rank, in, uh, something that I showed, is just a, uh, an average of ranks on on different uh, uh, on different goals. D does it make sense? Does Swab uh, normalize the data? You said that the, the biggest challenge is. You know, uh, non Swab does not do it. P people who prepare the data do okay. that. Uh, we just take the data and make it accessible and easy to use. Okay, so uh, uh, here you can, uh, so, so th these are like 40 uh, um, countries that happen to be in, in good shape. Uh, this is where they are on the map. If you're interested in countries that are at the end of the spectrum, uh, that's their locations. Uh, uh, and this is how they are distributed by uh, by rank, but in the same fashion, you can look at. Uh, uh, you see that there are about 90 indicators here, not the 469 or so indicators that have been proposed. Uh, many of these indicators are very difficult actually to compile information for. So even those indicators that we have here do not have complete coverage sometimes. Okay, you can look at, uh, uh, let's say, poverty below. Uh, 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 percent of people who live uh, on uh, dollar ninety 
uh, per day, percent of, percent of those people. So this has a fairly uh, uh, complete coverage, but poverty rate, uh, these are only countries for, for, which po for which poverty rate has been estimated. So it's not, it's not even. It, it's, I should say, work in progress. Uh, what, what I'm trying to, to, to demonstrate is not where the data come from. Also, you can, you can click on about survey and get the information about the source and follow that source. But, uh, uh, but to uh, show what the, soft, what the software can do. So, for example, uh, sorry about this. And maybe I'll just close that. Uh, you are looking at uh, uh, one interesting characteristic is subjective well-being. Let's look at it. That was estimated based on surveys, and it was uh, ranked on a scale from 0 to 10. So you can see how countries are distributed. Uh, it would be interesting to see if subjective well-being is actually how it relates to objectively measured variables, right? Uh, you can look at, uh, let's say, uh, subjective well-being versus, uh, for example, poverty. And uh, you would see that it's not, of course, a diagonal. There are lots of outliers on both sides. There are countries that are uh, uh, subjectively think that, uh, where populations subjectively think that they're uh, in, in good shape, but poverty level may be high, and the other way around. So if you look at... Uh, uh, these countries, for example, this is where um, uh, uh, poverty level is fairly low, but subjective well-being uh, is also quite low. Uh, these are uh, Cambodia, uh, Gabon, uh, Bulgaria, um, Sri Lanka. So uh, countries, so some of these countries experienced unrest in uh, recent years, so have been in the shadow of some larger metropolis, and that may contribute to um, lower uh, values of subjective well-being. So uh, uh, there, there may be multiple explanations that you, you can develop here. Uh, I, I would probably just invite you to play with the data because I, I will, will, will try to show you that it's very easy to, to play with the data and see. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, so the question is, uh, is it possible to look at the raw data? Uh, so again, if I go to about data and uh, click on uh, uh, click on this link, it will open another web page uh, where I got the data from. And there you, you, you can get to the actual spreadsheet and uh, look at the methodological description and see in the metadata statements where this data came from and how they were computed. And I was looking at it thinking about how to um, play around with, with my own data. So is that something you'll talk about? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and I also have my slides here. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so uh, I'll, I'll do this in just, it, it will be the demo after the next one. So um, the idea is, uh, as I said, totally different from what I've been doing in uh, my regular research, is how to make your data accessible and how to make it easy and fun and engaging to, uh, to work with. Uh, uh, how many of you have answered surveys, any types of surveys at work? At, you know, uh, uh, how many of you have ever tried to access the results of these surveys or have seen the results of these surveys um, or, or try to uh, not just uh, sometimes results come come back as uh, uh, documents as pie charts and bar charts but if you would want to combine and explore the variables you're out of luck uh, and that is a very common problem so e even if you go to uh, government web websites such as National Cancer Institute or uh, General Social Survey uh, source or, or, or another one, uh, all you see here is ability to load uh, data in SPSS, SAS, STATA, 
if you are a survey analyst, you are in luck. But if you are uh, a, somebody who is just interested in uh, exploring the data yourself, uh, it, it may be problematic. Uh, so this is an example of how you can do surveys with, uh, with our tool using the same data that you can download from, uh, from this site. So, so this general social survey, uh, uh, probably some of you have heard of that. That's a survey that is very important in the U.S. It's been run by National Opinion Research Center since 1972. Uh, every two years on average, uh, uh, there's an, an additional survey, and uh, uh, people a uh, answer all sorts of questions about different, different uh, types of... Um, uh, I think I actually should have it open somewhere. No, no. Oh, okay, all right, it opens. So uh, typically when you analyze surveys, you work with tables, you work with uh, um, charts, right? Uh, uh, here, uh, the visual paradigm is totally different. Each uh, 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 respondent is an icon, and you just observe how these people, uh, these icons uh, of form groups, uh, you can zoom in to any person and see how uh, that person responded to questions. Uh, you can have a few additional visual dimensions. Uh, so here we know that it's a white woman. Uh, so so you, can, you can specify your data, your icons to be uh, uh, representative of certain variables that you select, such as race and, uh, and gender or it could be other variables, it, it's uh, your, your choice. Um, uh, let's try to do some analysis here. So one of the questions was about happiness, general happiness. Let's look at how people uh, respond to questions about uh, your level of general happiness. We, we see that 26 people, 26 percent of respondents say they're very happy. Let's try to explain that based on some factors, and uh, we can try income, we can try other things that have been asked here, uh, or we can try level of education. Let's say highest year of uh, school completed. Uh, let's say 15 years and more. That increases your level of education somewhat from 26, uh, uh, your level of happiness, sorry, uh, from 26% to 31%. You can uh, see, uh, you can compute the contribution of this factor, to, so that's 5%. In fact, this is somewhat similar to um, a regression model, but based on mixed data, where you just compute contributions of different factors in, in, uh, in, in the explanation. In this case, explanation of uh, behavior saying very happy, uh, in response to this question. Uh, interestingly, uh, you can, there are several questions about education. If you look at the highest year of school completed by a spouse, actually your level of happiness will be significantly uh, higher. So now we have 44% saying they're very happy. Uh, as compared to previous 31, so the contribution here is 18%. And we, we can try to analyze it further and see how it's different by gender uh, or how, uh, uh, actually, the, the first question probably should be qualified by adding marital status because then we can uh, really compare these things. Uh, but, but you can see that analysis becomes uh, quite simple here, right? You just add additional factors, so let's say, uh, that would be adding gender, and uh, there are all sorts of factors here. So for, um, for one group, it will go in one direction. For, uh, for, for uh, females, it will go in a different direction, and I will let you interpret uh, the results yourself. So now how you get your own data into the system. Uh, let's say uh, I have uh, uh, a data set that uh, sits on my uh, desktop, and it's just a CSV file uh, that 
is a survey of uh, geoscientists who were asked about 300 or so questions about how they use different types of data, uh, how they use data uh, developed by others, uh, what kind of challenges they have when they need to use data and so on. Uh, we can open this data set in Excel and you will see that this is a very standard uh, Excel file that just has uh, questions uh, as columns and these are respondents. There are 1,500 or so people. Uh, so it's fairly easy easily formatted. Now, uh, when you create an account in SWAF, you, uh, you get, uh, yeah, this is my account and I have about 88 different surveys in this account. Uh, uh, once you create an account, you will have a gallery like that, but it will be empty initially. So if you want to add a survey, you just say new survey, point to this file, uh, which is on the desktop, uh, and it's here and give it a name, whatever, EC survey. Um, that's it. Who owns the data once you upload it on Swab? Uh, actually, you own the data, and I'll show you in a second. So uh, this is your personal gallery. Uh, for most people, I don't know what they put there. I just check the storage. Uh, because you can specify this data to be private and then it will not show up in your gallery for, for others. It will still show up for you to manage this, but when others come to your gallery, they will not see it. Uh, right, so, so we, we, we created this survey. You can already analyze it now, but it's not really that much fun because remember we can also associate uh, uh, shape and color of icons with some variables, and that will make it somewhat more interesting. Uh, so so uh, initially it's just the default, but everything that you, uh, that you want to do is already, you know, operations are already here. So let's close that and uh, make it look more interesting. Uh, so I will have uh, uh, gender as, I will have male and female silhouettes. So gender, it will parse the file and suggest uh, icons for me. Okay. I can also say that colors will uh, reflect primary discipline. Let's say we have geoscientists and computer scientists in that survey and those who said that they're both geo and, and computer scientists. Uh, you, you can change colors. I'm not going to do that now. And then you can also specify what will show up as a dynamic text over, uh, over each person. So when you zoom in, you, you will actually get more information about that. So let's do uh, my primary role here. When you submit it, um, it should uh, update the uh, the survey, and now you will have a somewhat better way of uh, um, looking at it and also sharing with sharing it with others. So it's kind of much easier than uh, trying to figure out how you can find a tool that will read a SPSS file or STATA file. Uh, so here uh, you can look at uh, um, distributions. Let's say how. Uh, people answered questions about the importance of different types of data and uh, um, so how important is it atmospheric to, uh, f how important atmospheric data are for you so that's a distribution you may hypothesize that if you are an atmospheric science person then atmospheric science data will be important for you um, which will be generally correct uh, Right, so I'm just subsetting this for, for, for people who declare themselves atmospheric scientists. Um, except for one person who says that the data in his domain is of low, is, are of low importance. For him, we can actually click on this guy and see uh, who that is. I mean, not who that is, but how that person answered 
uh, questions and try to explain why it happened. So this is a way to uh, zoom in from overall picture to deviant cases and kind of make this uh, uh, observation of the uh, transition from your general view to um, uh, view of a single small group, very smooth and, 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 and easy. Uh, and then if you are interested in this pattern, let's say you want to uh, share it with your core workers. You have a distributed group, then you would say comment on this, uh, look at this uh, uh, interesting uh, behavior on the left, right? So uh, you can save this annotation and then you can share this annotation with uh, others, so you just click share, that will generate a link that you can put on your Facebook or send to your co-workers or uh, put in an email and then when users click on that link they will open this same view and can take exploration in, in other directions. So uh, that answers your question yeah. somewhat. <laughs> Oh, man. yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, right. Uh, in, in this survey, I don't have uh, location information. If I would have latitude and longitude as, as two columns, uh, then I would just uh, click uh, map here, and it will show me a map. If I don't have latitude and longitude, but I have, but I have uh, uh, address, I will specify that this is address information and it will geocode on the fly and create a map. So there are two ways to do that. So to me, it looks like it's a very powerful system for describing data. Is there also a component that would account for some of the statistical power, uh, the statistical uh, properties of surveys or, or different types of uh, survey designs? Uh, uh, right, so the question is, uh, uh, can the system be made more statistically, traditionally statistically powerful? Uh, and uh, um, the answer is uh, somewhat, well, of course it's a yes, but uh, it's actually a little bit more complex. Uh, we are trying to develop, uh, to make it such that visualizations and statistical measures go hand in hand and reinforce each other. When we compute traditional statistics, quite often they would not have that clear uh, visual expressions uh, compared to increments or decrements of conditional frequencies. So those uh, 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 changes in conditional frequencies we generate on the fly uh, on the client side, as I showed in the table of rules b before, right, where you can compute contributions of uh, selected factors to, to explanation. Uh, we also have a connection with R, so uh, I'll show you in a second. If I would, oh yes, so here I can, I can also say that I want to include R, and it will include uh, uh, an icon on, on, the, uh, on the right that will allow me to, uh, to call R via OpenCPU interface and pass variables that I defined as independent variables and dependent variables to R to compute. In this case, we have enabled uh, logit probit and log linear models, but can be done, you know, the, the same bridge can be used for other types of computations. That, does it answer? Uh, maybe we can talk about it a little after. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So, so we have applications in, in, in different areas. Uh, and since I promised you uh, at least Picasso, I'll have time for Picasso, and then we may have to, uh, 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 to wrap up, uh, you, you may go to uh, the web page, and uh, you, you would find actually a bunch of uh, galleries of artists. So I have uh, Picasso, Van Gogh, uh, um, Dali, Baltus, uh, uh, Bosch, and uh, Rivera, and, and, and a 
few others. Uh, so let's look at Picasso. And uh, this really demonstrates the power of doing exploration with visual, uh, with, with visual images. So these are paintings. And as you see, as you zoom in, uh, they get, you, you get higher resolution versions. Uh, you have heard, I'm sure, of different uh, uh, periods in his life, like blue periods, pink periods, African period, and others. Let's try to detect these periods. Uh, so uh, uh, I would turn on uh, paintings that have been done at the turn of the century and sort this by year. And here you go, right? I, I, indeed, at, towards the end of uh, 1901, uh, he fell into uh, a deep depression that lasted like three years or four, almost four years. Uh, and uh, typically, it's attributed to um, his friend and fellow uh, 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 Spanish uh, artist who lived in, in Paris and uh, was a good friend. Uh, uh, Carlos Casagemas, he committed suicide, and so after uh, uh, Picasso went through some very dark times. And uh, uh, most of the paintings are also, the, the subjects are uh, beggars and um, uh, all sorts of... Very good question. <laughs> uh, both ways. Uh, uh, I work with uh, uh, several uh, art historians. Uh, they, they send me data. So, for example, the Van Gogh data set he came from Lev Manovich, who, who works in New York, and he's uh, director of Software Studies Initiative and also a practicing artist. Uh, and so he studies uh, so-called uh, style spaces. You can, you can place photograph of... Uh, uh, um, of a painting in multi-dimensional space, look at clusters and see how, uh, as uh, artists move from, let's say, one place to another, how uh, wh whether it corresponded to changed clusters. Uh, yes, based on uh, uh, brightness, hue, saturation, plus other things that you uh, uh, get from the picture. Other things become more difficult. Brightness, hue, saturation is... Uh, fairly easy to get, and this is what we have in Van Gogh. Uh, so maybe I can can show you. So there are, there are two ways. One is uh, there are actually more than two ways. One is to precompute some of these measures based on image characteristics. Another is to let people come to uh, this application and annotate it in the way I showed you, and they would be able to capture some more information. Uh, and uh, uh, then we, we also have an, a system where uh, people have been annotated based on forms so that the information goes directly, uh, go, goes back in, into, into SWAF and people can uh, analyze it immediately. Uh, that, does it answer your question? Right. So uh, in, in the future, we're planning to have uh, a somewhat more advanced system where people will be able to define themselves what kind of additional attributes of uh, pictures they would want to extract and bring into an analysis. For now, uh, it's done outside the visual interface. Did, did you have some animal lo locomotion there? When I um, first came into the room that was on the screen, there were horses running, and I wondered if you had worms crawling and <laughs> turtles going and <laughs> what all. And I thought I saw our animals um, there. I don't, no. I don't have horses. I have tigers. Oh. <laughs> uh, so it's been used for camera trap uh, images. And you can look at a uh, collection of images and, so let's say, uh, tigers or uh, oncas or others, and see at what... It all depends on what metadata you have. Uh, you can see at what times of day they're active or uh, at what temperatures they tend to show up and... It, it's actually interesting to compare it with, uh, across different species. Uh, I also have examples from uh, a system called Eye Naturalist, where uh, uh, people contribute their photographs of what they observe uh, 
you know, in the yards. And that goes into a large uh, image archive with metadata. So I have some examples with that. Not, not with horses, no. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, I have one last slide, I think, uh, that will, uh, yeah, so the types of applications I more or less described, uh, I will skip that, and uh, uh, the last slide is, this is really an invitation to explore what you can do with the data yourself. Uh, it's a free system, it's open source system, it's supported by National Science Foundation, uh, and uh, you can uh, create a login on the system, you will get your personal gallery, uh, upload your data and uh, play with it. We, we o uh, opened it up about five months ago, we have 90 users who load their data, and you're very welcome uh, to do this. I, I really think that making data easily accessible will uh, make a dramatic impact on uh, this whole data revolution or make a real difference there because it will increase the level of trust that people have uh, in, uh, in any statements based on data and it will let people play with the data themselves, which is interesting. Thank you very much. And sorry about the difference. Thank you for coming. Questions? Uh, yeah, I have another question. Could this handle a Genuine big data set like computational fluid dynamics data set? Uh, we'll need to talk. Uh, so, so the question is uh, uh, can this handle very large data sets? We have interfaced it with uh, um, a system that has about 400,000 records. So, of course, you cannot put 400,000 dots on a single screen. Uh, the maximum we had so far was uh, 8,300, uh, and these were images of. Uh, uh, macrofossil samples from a uh, uh, British Geological Survey. It's, it's a fairly large application, about uh, 30 uh, gigabytes worth of data. Well, I, should, I can say in one screen, but really it, 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 uh, at some point these are dots, and when you zoom in, you actually get more, more information. Uh, so with uh, large collections, you have to first search and come up with a subset that would be meaningful to display in uh, in SWAF, and w we've done that. So, if you have some specific application in mind, we can talk. Okay, so um, individually, you can ask questions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.